enjoy speaking to the Rotarians. Um, I know that your club uh, is active on behalf of charitable causes, and being the Capital Rotary, I also know that you are in tune to statewide issues. You couldn't help but be attuned to statewide issues given the news that uh, you know comes out of Columbus and is uh, covered extensively. Your motto, service above self, is such a noble one that I'm sure you're proud that Rotary International pioneered the concept of service club more than a century ago, a nonprofit organization that would bring people together, mostly business people, for the betterment of society. Obviously, your achievements, your global achievements, are legendary, and I know that you have been active in central Ohio for many years as well. Um, the help with the needy and uh, the children of our community is um, equally as legendary. President Blivens and your club leaders invited me to give you an update on the courts in Ohio. So I'm going to start by pointing out that the mission of the judicial branch of our state government is very complex. One way to explain this complexity is to expose a couple of myths and then explain a little bit, hope to explain a little bit. Um, and I hope that this will give you some context as to the work of the courts statewide. I also hope to give each of you some hard facts that you can spring on your colleagues when you go back to work this afternoon and test their knowledge. So here's myth number one. The federal court system is where all the action is. You know, you always hear about the federal court system, nightly news, national news, are always talking about what's happening in the United States Supreme Court. That doesn't mean that just because they grab all the headlines, that that's where the action is. The federal system may seize more than its share of headlines, but here's the truth. Of all the cases across America in a given year, all of the cases, all of the filings in a given year, 96% of the cases filed in the United States are in the state courts. We have by far, by far, the lion's share of the controversies and the issues to be decided and the problems to be, to be solved in the state courts. That leaves 4% for the federal courts. So ask your colleagues what they, what they think is more, uh, more influential. Um, these are not alternative facts. These are facts. <laughs> and of those 4%, more than 60% of the cases involve bankruptcy. So 4% go to the, uh, you know, the federal system and 60% of those 4% are bankruptcies, 96% versus 4%. Headline writers and other journalists might not believe you, um, but I hope you believe it. So consider the following. There's just under 900 federal judges in the entire country. That, uh, and those judges, well, no, are appointed for life by the president and confirmed by the Senate. In the states, there are 18,000 court supreme, or 18,000 state court judges. That's across all 50 states. That's a ratio of 20 to 1. Furthermore, state judges handle a much wider array of cases. In general, federal courts do not exercise jurisdiction over areas such as domestic relations, suits between citizens of the same state where no federal issue is involved. Most criminal activity, by far the largest portion of the criminal activity, takes place in the uh, state courts. All probate matters, the disposition of estates, guardianships, wills, that sort of stuff, all in the county probate courts, real estate tax and property disputes, and the list goes on. These are topics the federal court does not um, even touch. Even in many instances when a federal law is at issue, a case will end up in state court. One example would be juvenile violations of federal law. The upshot of these statistics is that by virtue of volume and types of cases, state courts touch the lives of Americans, young and old, rich and poor, and everybody in between, in far greater measure and much more directly than our federal brethren. In a typical year, state courts handle close to 100 million cases. That's nearly one case for every three Americans. Here's something to think about, and I think to be proud of as Americans, our system of state courts makes our country unique in the world. It is a break with the European systems that our founders knew well. 
the, the um, court system in the United States, the presumptions we enjoy, the constitutions that we follow, the, the way our laws are made and respected by the rule of law is so different from all other countries in the world. I've traveled to many other countries, interacted with many members of the judiciary around the globe, and, and I have to say that our country and our laws and our system is the envy of many. I should also add that the overwhelming majority of state judges must stand for election, re-election or retention, making them directly accountable to voters. That's another departure from the appointed for life federal system. Um, okay, here's myth number two. You've all heard this one. Judges should limit themselves to being like umpires or referees, calling balls and strikes or pass interference or tennis serves that lip the net. Perhaps on one level, a philosophical level, the, empire, the umpire metaphor works. It works if the intention is to promote the concept that judges are impartial and fact-driven and objective and guided by the rule of law, which is all true and has to be that way. All judges should adhere to that ideal uh, and practice it. But on an everyday level, and remember, state courts are America's everyday courts, the metaphor simply does not work. Extending the empire metaphor beyond impartiality is too simplistic and unworkable for a range of issues that we confront. It sells our judges short. And it sells short the rule of law. Being a mere umpire doesn't work when we're dealing with the complexities of domestic violence, child custody, or juvenile delinquency. Judges and justices must not simply recognize and point out observance and non-observance of the law and then just walk away. To do our job properly, we must use our God-given intellects to levy justice and also arrive at remedies. This has always been so, but it never, it's never been more true than today when we, we in the judiciary are being called upon more and more to help people and thus help society, to fix problems that are becoming ever so thorny in uh, plaguing us. We are there to help people solve problems with solutions that they cannot come up with, devise themselves. We're helping them solve problems that they cannot do themselves. Nobody comes voluntarily to court. I'm aware of that. I'm not, you know, I understand and I take no offense to the fact that nobody wants to really see me uh, across the bench. I understand that. Or any other judge for that matter. Um, but. Uh, you know, unless you're going to get married by a judge, but even then, it could be a little iffy. <laughs> so I understand, I understand that uh, people come to us because they are at a low point in their lives, they've got nowhere else to go, and the courts are the way our society fixes problems. The bench is a place for holistic thinking. We must search for truth and justice and a more just and workable society. I'm not making a call for a brand of judicial activism known as legislating from the bench. That's not what I'm talking about. Lawmaking is the province of the legislature. Rather, I'm saying that within the bounds of the judiciary's right of review and rulemaking exists a role for the courts that acknowledge the complexities of life, even death, the uniqueness of every case, and the need for careful thought and wise administration of justice and the potential for flexibility within our judicial system. Uh, I reflect often on the fact that when I was a trial judge, I remember going for a period of about three and a half months where I didn't try a case. Now, I had plenty of cases on my docket, don't get me wrong, criminal cases and civil cases. My docket was jam-packed. This was in the mid-90s. Um, but I settled every case for that three plus month period by knowing my case, bringing the parties into my chambers so that I could talk to the litigants and, and uh, figure out what they wanted, how, what they wanted when they walked out of the courtroom and was able to solve all of those. So we did not have to impanel a jury or have a jury or have any kind of a trial uh, for over three months. I think that that is, it's not, that is the role of the judge, to roll your sleeves up to get into the cases with the litigants and figure out how you can solve their problems. Not just look in a book and say, here's what the law says and you know that's the way it's gonna be. 
there's a there's got to be a human element in it because as I said we're dealing with human beings now speaking about dealing with two uh, with human beings there are two current issues and I call them crises that are facing the judiciary and facing society as a whole um, and I'm going to use these to illustrate my point. There are issues I've focused on in Ohio and nationally for the last several years. One is our outmoded system of fines, fees, and bail, which is accurately referred to as America's debtor prison. The other is our opioid epidemic. First, opioids. I'm sure that you've read Ohio recorded 5,231 drug deaths in the 12 months ending last September, an increase of 31% over the prior year, which was itself an increase of a similar percentage over the year prior to that. That's 11 Ohioans dying every day on average. In Pennsylvania, there were 5,577. 5 Florida, 5,516. Um, and these represent drug poisonings, overdose deaths uh, in all of these states. And these are very grim statistics. We hear them a lot. And we need to remember that these are people. They are not just statistics. They are young people. They are middle-aged people. And they are, in some cases, older individuals who are dying as a result of this opioid epidemic. The numbers cannot relate to the pain of the victim. Uh, or their loved ones and the cost to our society. As Rotarians, you know that in the 1950s, Rotary International geared up for a decades-long fight against polio, uh, first with iron lung machines for the afflicted, then the distribution of the Salk, Salk and Sabin vaccines. A disease that crippled millions, including a sitting president, was cut to 350,000 worldwide in the 1980s when Rotary International Polio Plus Initiative showed the incredible private sector support of a public health initiative. More than 3 billion vaccinations later, the collective accomplishments of dedicated government and private sector people was astonishing. Polio was eradicated in the Americas in 1994 and barely exists today except for a few countries. That kind of service, that kind of hard work and education is needed now as we fight the opioid crisis that is ravaging our state and our nation. There are differences, of course. Polio is a virus. Opioid addiction most often begins as medication, a medication that is distributed by a physician. But the out of control nature of the opioid crisis causes alarm and bewilderment among our country's leadership and citizenry, just as polio did. There's no vaccine to stop the epidemic. Solving this crisis is more procedural than medical at times, and we can start by believing in ourselves and thinking smart to create pathways out. The court system is at the center of the situation. Nearly two years ago, I led our dedicated Supreme Court of Ohio staff in convening a multi-state conference in Cincinnati dedicated to fighting the opioid epidemic. We have engaged eight court, eight uh, states, I should say, that border Ohio and are close by, and it's called the Regional Judicial Opioid Initiative. It was the first summit of its kind in the country, and within the past year, we've developed a national effort based on the model here in Ohio. Representatives from state Supreme Courts, county courts, law enforcement, federal and state health authorities, and aid groups have been meeting across these eight states to exchange information, develop plans, and execute them. So why do we need to go across state lines? Why can't we just concentrate on what's happening in Ohio? It's because people who are addicted to these, to heroin and other opioids don't respect borders. They don't just keep their addiction within the state. They're crossing over to uh, jurisdictions that surround Ohio and beyond. So this is, as I said, a regional problem. Representatives, as I said, we need to work together because doctor shopping of legal drugs, smuggling of illicit drugs, and other elements of the problem operate without regard to our state borders. We're focusing on these groups because the opioid problem is simultaneously a criminal justice issue, a public health issue, a family disintegration and social service crisis that needs multiple approaches and multiple solutions. Over these 20 months, the Regional Judicial Opioid Initiative has ramped up its coordination and exploration of how courts, 
treatment providers and the executive and legislative branches can work together. This is my timer. I'm going over a little bit. <laughs> I hope you'll indulge me. Um, this crisis demands another kind of border crossing, the crossing of the lines between branches of government. I can report to you that intra and interstate cooperation is working. Just last week, Governor Kasich announced that doctor shopping behavior in the state had declined 88% in the last eight years and that legal opioid doses have gone down 30% in seven years. It's a battle being fought on several fronts. For many judges, court staff, and advocates, the opioid, opioid epidemic is a family problem. For example, substance abuse is a major cause of children being removed from the homes in our state. About 50% of the children removed from parental custody in Ohio are in homes where the parents are abusing drugs. Many counties in Ohio report percentages in the 70s, 80s, and 90% of the children that have to be removed from the home is due to one or more parents being involved with opioids. In three rural counties, it's 100%. The Public Children's Services Association of Ohio found in a recent study that 97% of Ohio's county welfare directors reported opioid abuse as a serious problem in their communities. It's of course a law enforcement uh, problem and many victims begin their addictions with legally prescribed drugs. When their prescriptions run out, they turn to illegally trafficked pharmaceuticals or illegal opioids such as heroin and fentanyl. You all have heard about fentanyl and the deadly, deadly nature of fentanyl and carfentanyl. In fact, in line with the governor's details last week, death from prescription opioids have been falling four or five straight years in Ohio due to large part to efforts to track prescription data. Now don't, I hope you're not confused when I say that prescription opioid deaths are going down because we're doing a better job of mandating that pharmacies and doctors and whoever distributes those are involved in the record keeping process. That's one thing. But the other, the other side of the coin is that many of those people who are addicted then get their pills on the street from a dealer. Uh, they turn to other drugs, they will turn to heroin. Heroin is a much cheaper high for um, these addicts than opioid. To buy an opioid pill can be 50, 60, sometimes $80 a pill. Heroin is $5, $5, and, and that's the difference, and that's why we have such a spike in heroin in our state and across this country. Um, we've made a lot of progress, but I have to point out that as new solutions take hold in one area, the problem shifts to another. For example, methamphetamine use, which was declining as the opioids rose, is making a comeback. And this time, it's a lot of meth being abused, a lot of the meth that is being abused is not homemade, it's being imported, imported from Mexico. Uh, it's much cheaper and safer to manufacture in Mexico and just transport the end product than it is to set up a meth lab uh, in your garage or in a trailer or someplace because of the contaminants and the issues involved with that. So a dealer does a, a much better uh, book of business if they are peddling meth that was made and comes from Mexico. Drug abuse in America is a deep and serious problem that affects the very social fabric. Now, polio was relegated to the history books, thankfully, but we should remember that 60 years ago, that crisis seemed intractable, costly, and endless. It caused people to lose hope. So let's not lose hope over op opioids. Let's think, act, and fight. Um, you know, sometimes when I talk to our judges, they tell me they feel more like a social worker than they do a judge. Uh, because that's just the changing nature of our business in the judiciary. Remedies are a mission. Mere umpiring won't solve these problems. Our mission has changed the nature of our courts. One answer has been specialized dockets, a term you may not be familiar with, but specialized dockets are fairly recent innovations, but their use is proliferating. It wasn't so many years ago that a specialized docket meant juvenile court. That was the original specialized docket. But in 1989, Miami-Dade County, Florida established the first recognized drug court. Ordinary courts and procedures were deemed inadequate to address these problems. 
Ohio followed with one drug court in 1995, then our state started on a path to become a national leader in the specialized docket movement. Today in Ohio, we have more than 240 specialized docket courts in 60 of our 88 counties. The list is long. We've got 102 drug courts, we've got 43 mental health courts, 30 family, family dependency treatment courts, 23 veterans courts, 12 reentry courts, eight DUI courts, seven juvenile treatment courts, six domestic violence courts, five human trafficking courts, and two substance abuse mental health courts. We've got truancy courts, education courts, and child support enforcement courts, and one sex offender court. Ohio is the second largest number of juvenile specific specialized dockets in America. It was our specialized docket section and its able staff at the Supreme Court that led the creation of the Regional Judicial Opioid Initiative. Our initiative is dynamic. It provides technical and program support to trial courts, engages in best practice outreaches with them, and certifies them through their compliance with the rules and the standards of review that include on-site visits by our staff. These are not the courts of 20 years ago because we don't have the problems of 20 years ago. Society's problems are different and the solutions are complex and the needs are vast. Judges have always had to be case managers, but now they're also care managers. In fact, juvenile court judge in Dayton came upon a novel solution to his huge docket that involves complex treatment issues of juveniles. And I've sat in on this court and I've seen the young people that have come before the judge because of their addiction. Um, it involves complex treatment and sentencing and counseling for scores of youth, many who come from broken homes with varying degrees of criminality, drug abuse, or absentee parents, but many also from what we would by definition call stable homes. It, no one, no family is immune. He wondered if IBM's artificial intelligence system, Watson, could help him keep track of it all, and IBM responded. And Judge Tony Capizzi is now operating the first Watson-aided court in America. When you consider the lengths to which we must go today to administer justice fairly and efficiently, the concept of judge as an empire is almost an insult. It's been my good fortune to have been elected last year as president of the Conference of Chief Justices, which is the chief justices of the entire country. In 2016, I was named co-chair of the National uh, Task Force on Fines, Fees, and Bail Practices, created by the Conference of Chief Justices and the Conference of State Court Administrators. One of the focus, well, my focus as um, uh, chief of the chiefs, if you want to, you know, call that's the phrase they use, is to focus on both opioid and debtor's prison. Now, I have a whole lot to say about debtor's prison, but you heard about five minutes ago my, uh, my alarm went off. So I'm going to ask you to invite me back someday soon, and I will talk to you about debtor's prisons, fines, fees, and bail, and the challenges that that presents for our courts and for society. So with that, I've got a few minutes for questions. Your Honor, settlements are important. But it's also important sometimes to actually see justice being done in the courts. Are you concerned that less than 1% of the civil cases being filed in this county, and I think generally around the state, actually go to trial? Yes, that is a problem. That's a movement within the bar to address the reasons that there are so many settlements and so many alternatives to using the court system. And that's one of the big problems. I say this to our judges all the time. You've got to step up your game when it comes to the civil litigation because the parties aren't going to wait. They're not going to wait for their time to go to court when they've got to stretch that out for two, three, four years. We've got to be tighter on our discovery um, in position so that you know all the cards are laid on the table earlier so you can work out a settlement you know because everybody understands what you know what's at stake there um, but we have alternatives to litigation we have arbitration mediation private judging um, and those are our competitors as far as you know it, it's obvious those are our competitors and parties will opt for not going to court if we can't deliver better services, more timely, 
uh, and more um, you know, f encompassing for all the problems. So that is a problem. It's a problem that the judiciary is mindful of and trying to tackle, but we also have uh, the issue of uh, precedent of criminal cases, which oftentimes will be set and then the civil case is bumped off the schedule until the criminal case is heard because there's very tight timelines within a criminal. But you're absolutely right, and it's an issue that we are working on with our um, judges um, and the bar. Because, you know, believe it or not, there's a lot of uh, lawyers out there that are complaining that they don't get to, to try a case. They want to try a case. They become litigators. That's what they're... they're um, career has been about, and yet they can't get into court because, one, the window of opportunity is, uh, you know, um, uh, contracted, but also um, the, the attitude, the, the, um, the delay, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to call it the delay impedes that. You know, there's young attorneys that, you know, consider themselves lit litigators because they've gotten to argue a motion before the court rather than a trial. So we've got to fix that because we have a great system. Our jury system and uh, the way that we try cases and you know we just have to do a better job of managing the time and the access. But thanks for your question. So I know a lot of things when I go in a voting booth, but one of them is when I'm faced with judges, I have no idea what to do for the most part. So what advice can you give all of us um, on how we decide what judges you know what, it's almost like you're a plant in the uh, audience for this next. Um, we have on the S Supreme Court of Ohio website um, a great uh, um, tool that you can use to learn about the people that are running for judges, the incumbents, the challengers, um, et cetera. Um, if you go to, uh, well, you can get through get to it through our website, which is sc.ohio.gov. But the website, I'm going to give you this address. I'll give you a minute to all get your pens out and write this down. It's judicialvotescount.org. If you go to that website and you go down to Franklin County, you will see all of the candidates, not just the incumbents, but you're going to see all of the candidates. They all answer the same questions in their own words, and then they supplement it with any other information that they think is relevant to their uh, to make their case to the voters. So it's judicialvotescount.org, and there is a great starting point to figure out who the candidates are, what office they're running for, and what their experience has been to help you make that decision. It's also at the beginning of that, um, that website, judicialvotescount.org, there's a little tutorial that talks about the different types of courts and what those courts do. You know, the municipal court, what they do, well, their races aren't this year, but common pleas, appellate court, and supreme court races are on the ballot this year. And educate yourself. Uh, use that website, use your social media to give it to all of your um, you know, friends that uh, are going to go to the polls and say, here's something you can take a look at. And you don't then walk away without voting for the judges. You know, in 2012, in Cuyahoga County, there was a 40% drop off in the number of votes cast between the presidential and the judiciary. 40% of the people that cast a vote did not vote for the judges. And when we did a poll across the state as to why don't you vote for the judiciary, and they say, we don't know enough about it. So I've got this website. I put it together with the Ohio Bar Association, League of Women Voters, uh, University of Akron, and um, some of the media out or media entities. And it's a it's a great the site, the only shortcoming is I don't have enough money to promote it and put commercials on about judicialvotescount.org. So with that, I have really imposed on your time, and I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Your Honor. We appreciate your time, and I think we can definitely set up having her back to hear about Debtor's Prison.